these for that. Take your Bibles as we mentioned. And chapter 19, John chapter 19. Let me say uh, happy Father's Day to the, the dads, all to, the, to all the fathers. We want to uh, make sure on behalf of the church and myself, my family, we want to say happy Father's Day to all the men who are fathers and to those that uh, may one day be fathers as well. And um, I don't, uh, we don't uh, seem to emphasize Father's Day as much as Mother's Day, maybe because dad just doesn't need as much recognition, right? Uh, mom needs the recognition, dad just, uh, we're good to go, right? Uh, but happy Father's Day. We will preach a little bit on uh, Father's responsibility in preaching on Jesus Christ. Um, John chapter 19, we'll read verses 23 through 27. Before we get to the reading, let me say that I want to uh, give the setting of our passage or the selection that we'll be reading. Uh, here, uh, Jesus is on the cross. So the night before our passage, uh, Jesus was arrested. So he's in the garden. He is with his disciples. We know the story, how he's arrested. Uh, he's brought up on false charges by a mock trial at the high priest's house. And we could uh, read that. We won't take the time to read all of this building up. You know the story. Uh, he was brought before Pilate. He was brought before Herod. He was brought back to Pilate. He was used as a political bargaining chip back and forth and uh, so that uh, uh, politically people could get back in the same in good graces of each other. Uh, uh, he was exchanged. He exchanged sentences with a murderer, with Barabbas. And so all of this has happened so far. He was mocked. He was scourged. He was beaten. And now he is hanging on the cross. And so we, that's where we take up our story. Let's join me in standing in honor of the reading of God's word as we read John chapter 19, we'll read verses 23 down to, uh, through verse 27. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my, uh, my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. That passage is, uh, is in the book of Psalms, the 22nd Psalm, Psalm 22, verse 18. That that's the prophecy fulfilled in, in uh, John 19, verse 24. Verse 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour his disciple took her unto his own home. The title of the message this morning is this, Jesus the Provider. Jesus the Provider. Father in heaven, we come before your presence. Uh, uh, humbly begging and seeking your power, your strength uh, to preach your word. Lord, I, I desperately desire to have, to, to say what you want me to say, to be in your spirit, uh, that uh, what you once said is said. I pray that you'd use me this morning. Fill me with your spirit. Fill each hearer with your spirit, we pray. Help us be doers of the word. Lord, we, we think uh, of uh, uh, the many that are not here, whether they're on vacation or ill, number of folks that are sick. We think about those in the hospital. We think about Brother Becker, we think about Brother Vest and uh, Brother Finner, who's not doing well. Um, uh, we just uh, pray that, uh, or is going through chemo. Uh, we just pray that you'd uh, be with each of these, and we just pray that uh, a number of others. Think about Rita Klein in the hospital down in Texas. We just pray that you would heal her and work in her body. Uh, we pray that you'd, be, uh, uh, that you'd speak through me again, we pray, and that your will be done through us, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. As we read this passage, I think, what a loving God we serve. What a merciful God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. I think about the song, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. You say, I've never heard that. Well, you weren't in children's church then. They sang that in children's church. Uh, that's, a, that's a, you know, some of those kids' songs, those songs we sing in children's church, they're filled with such good doctrine, and, and, and we probably ought to sing those in here, although we sing a, a number of good songs here. We serve a great God who sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. What a loving God. We preached on John chapter 3 last week. We didn't really preach much on verse 16, but uh, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. 
And so you say, how, how much did God love us? So much that he gave his only begotten son. What a great God we serve uh, that he sent his son to be the savior of the world. What, uh, uh, he could not save us unless he became man like us. That he would suffer the same death that we serve. What a merciful God. What a merciful God to look on us and say, you know what, I'm going to come down. Can you think of another God, little g, that someone could worship or does worship that became like his, uh, the, those that worship him, that became man, that sent his own flesh, to send his only begotten son to man, uh, that, that he could be like us, humanly speaking, still divine, still a God, but man. Can you think of another uh, uh, story like that, that he would send his son, and not only that, but that he would uh, come and die for us, that he would uh, uh, lower himself, humble himself, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, to the death, even the death of the cross. What a merciful God, that he would look on us and say, you know what, I can, I'm going to identify with you. I, 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 want, I, I want my, flesh, I want my, my being to be in the same flesh that you are in. And so what a merciful God that he would send his son to, to us. And then that he would do what we cannot do in our flesh. He would conquer death by a bodily resurrection. Oh, to, for him to come and to die on the cross to be like us may not have been that much. But the fact that he rose from the grave, that he conquered the death. Now, it was much for him to come. It was great for him to die. But humanly speaking, the, the greatest act was for him to rise from that. You can't do that. I can't do that. Our flesh can't overcome death. Like we can't overcome death and the, 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 the grip that death has on us with, with uh, sin and hell. We, we can't overcome that. And so what a mighty God we serve that he was over, uh, able to overcome that. We see here on the cross, not just his divinity, but his humanity. In this passage, we see the humanity of Jesus Christ. Verse 25 says that, that, that there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. So there's three Marys that are standing here. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, the, 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 the sister uh, uh, of, uh, the sister of, of his mother. Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and then Mary Magdalene. They're all standing there. And while he's on the cross, while he's dying, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, that's John, John the Beloved, the same that wrote this book, the same that wrote the, book, uh, the, the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the same that wrote the book of Revelation, that John, John uh, the Beloved, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, Behold thy son. So he looks at Mary, his mother, his earthly mother, and he says, Woman, behold thy son. And then he looks at John, and he says uh, to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own. And this is important because his in his divinity, he is our Savior, but in his humanity, he is our standard, our example. He is the one that we are to follow. In His divinity, He is our Savior. But we can't follow Him in that regard. We can't be a, a Savior. I, a number of months ago, I talked about a Savior uh, being a Savior, and I mentioned it in the, the same context that the judges were Saviors. Lowercase s. Uh, certainly, we can't save anyone, but uh, to bring someone to the Savior. And you and I, we can't be Saviors. We can't follow him in that regard. There's, uh, we could uh, try to follow Jesus Christ. And we think about the, the song, Through It All, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Uh, we trust in Jesus, uh, uh, God because he, he is the Savior, because his divinity, because he is God. I can't do that. You can't look at a, a, a man. You can't look at uh, uh, your, your father. It's Father's Day. You can't look at your husband. You can't look at uh, uh, a pastor. You can't look at another man and say, hey, he's my Savior. No other man can do that. But in his humanity, he is our standard. In his humanity, we can say, I can do that. I need to follow him. I need to be like Jesus. I need to be like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so he is our standard. He is, he is our example. As we celebrate Father's Day today, we see how Jesus in his humanity was the great 
provider. Now, Jesus was not a humanly father. He didn't have an offspring. But as a man, he was a provider. He provided. Now, now I don't know what happened to Joseph, uh, his earthly father. Uh, I believe that he must have been dead at that, at that point. Jesus, obviously the oldest of Mary's children, right? The oldest, uh, because he was uh, born of a virgin. So Mary had other children after him, but he obviously was the oldest. So the responsibility for uh, providing for Mary, if Joseph was not there, now we don't know where Joseph was, but Joseph was not mentioned after, was it Luke chapter 2? We'll get there in a little bit. Uh, after that, we don't, we don't ever, uh, Joseph is never mentioned, so most believe that Joseph must have, uh, have uh, expired, must have died. Um, but we don't know where he was, but Jesus, if Joseph had gone, and as Jesus as the oldest was providing for his family. Here he is as a provider. Now, the, the intricacies of this is so important, is so neat, and we're going to get to this, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but in his provision, he was providing. And if he had not provided, he could not have been the provider. Now you say, what are you talking about? We'll get to all of that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But the, in his provision, while he's providing, he is providing. And if he had not been providing, he could not have provided. What amazing thought. You say, Pastor, I'm so confused. Hopefully you'll not be confused when we get to the end of the message. But in his humanity, he provided food for others. Think about Jesus as a provider. How many people did Jesus feed? Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. Jesus provided food. Jesus provided health. How many times, how many people did Jesus heal? Uh, we don't, there's no way for us to know. There's a number of places and passages that says they brought the sick to him and he healed. We have no idea how many people he healed, but we know that he healed. He provided health. He provided a, he provided a sound mind. There was many that he cast out demons of that gave them, think about the, 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 maybe the greatest example in regard to the word there is the, the, the demon, uh, the, the maniac of, of gatherings. And, and when he cast out the, the, uh, the devils, the man was sitting and clothed in his right mind. Imagine how many people that Jesus provided a sound mind for provided a sound, uh, for, for whom they provided, he provided a sound mind. But in his humanity, he not only provided for others, he also provided for his own. Now let's first of all consider the beneficiary of his provision. We see Mary, verse 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary the Ma uh, uh, Magdalene. Now we see Mary, Jesus could not have become a man without a woman. Not, uh, not, not humanly speaking, could God have provided for himself a, a sacrifice outside of a woman? Maybe he could have, maybe he could have uh, decided just to, God could do whatever. But would they be, would he be a man? Would he be human? God decided to use this woman, to use Mary, uh, 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 Jesus, born of a virgin. It was prophesied in Isaiah uh, 7 that a virgin would conceive, and Mary was God's choice. The Bible says, blessed among women. It has been said, that, it has been suggested that if Christ was the man of sorrows, that surely Mary, Mary must have been the woman of sorrows. Now think of Jesus, man of sorrows, what a, uh, what a name. Had Jesus hang on the cross. And here's his mother, Mary, at the cross. No one, humanly speaking, knew him better, certainly, than Mary. Jesus, uh, who bore our sorrows, and certainly I'm not saying that he was, uh, she, she bore our sorrows like he did, but uh, having a sorrowful heart is what I mean. Jesus bearing our sorrows, knowing who he was, knowing that he was innocent, knowing why he was hanging there, not just, I don't think, physically, but spiritually, she must have had a heavy heart. She must have been sorrowful. 
as she's standing at the feet of her son who's taking away the sin of the world. Mary. Imagine all that she had suffered for being blessed among women. Now think about that. We, we think about Mary. Mary blessed among women. Imagine all that she suffered because she was blessed. And you say, well, that's kind of an oxymoron, but often that's the case when someone is blessed, when God, uh, someone receives God's blessings, there's, they also suffer uh, greatly because of that. Uh, there's, uh, um, the, the blessings far outweigh the, the, uh, the sorrow. The, the blessings are eternal, the sorrows are temporal, but certainly the, the sorrows are there. We don't know where Ju uh, Joseph was. He was possibly dead. Judas, his brother. James, his brother. Other brothers or sisters of Jesus Christ. Uh, we don't know where they were. But the beneficiary in this case is Mary. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, there was a burden to provide for his mother. Now again, I don't know where Judas was. I don't know where James. We know certainly he had at least two brothers. Uh, we, we know that he had sisters because uh, of the passage that says that aren't his brothers and sisters among us? So we know, and that may have referred to cousins and so forth. Uh, uh, Bible terminology sometimes refers to brothers and sisters, as, uh, or cousins as brothers and sisters. But we know that he clearly had two brothers, Judas and James. Where were they? I, I don't know. But wouldn't it have seemed to make sense to say, all right, Judas, take care of our mother? But no one else was there except for John. And Jesus looked at Mary and he said, Mary, behold thy son. And he looked at John and he said, behold thy mother. In his death, he's providing for his mother. He's being a provider. Now, after we talk about the, the beneficiary of his provision, I, I want to uh, uh, note the burden of his provision. You say, Pastor, what's the big deal? Well, I realized 1 Timothy chapter 5 had not been written yet when Jesus was hanging on the cross. But principles of this exist all the way back predating the law. The, 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 the verse clearly stated, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8, says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Jesus could not, listen, could not be the provider of salvation had he not provided for his own. Now think about that. Jesus, the only way he could provide for salvation, the only way that he could be the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world is if he was perfect without sin, that, that there was no uh, fault found in him. Had he left someone unprovided for, he could not have provided salvation. He would have been a, a sinner. He would have, been, he would have fallen short. Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. You and I come short of God's glory. Jesus Christ, in his, while he is providing salvation, we'll talk about that in a moment, while he is providing, he was providing. And if he hadn't provided for his mother, he could not have provided salvation. And so he, he understood the importance. Jesus was providing for his own. You've heard of visionaries before. Fathers should be provisionaries. You say, Pastor, I don't think that's a word. That's not. I looked it up. I just made it up. Visionaries. How many have ever heard the word visionary? Fathers should be provisionaries. It's not a word. I'm just, go with me, all right? Provisionaries. They should be providers. They should be one who provide, those that provide for their family. Just like Jesus provided for Mary, a father is one who provides. A, a, a father, first of all, must provide sustenance. Now, when he's talking about uh, Mary and John, when he looks at John and says, Behold thy mother, I believe what he's talking about is the sustenance. Uh, a roof, clothing, food, the basics of life. Uh, I believe that he's talking about uh, uh, taking care of her until... Uh, she no longer needs sustenance until uh, the day that she dies. And so he looks at John and he says, John, 
uh, behold thy mother. And that, those three words, behold thy mother, uh, is a, a huge mouthful. It's not just, hey, look, uh, she's, she's yours now. But he was providing for, he said, you have to provide for her. He was providing sustenance. But a father doesn't just provide sustenance. A father should, by the way, provide sustenance. Dads, our responsibility is to provide for our family. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for, uh, for wives uh, that, that help. And, and uh, my, my wife, she teaches in the school and she helps. Uh, but it, the responsibility doesn't fall on my wife. The responsibility falls on me. I should be the provider for our family. I am the, the provisionary. I know it's not a word, just, just uh, you understand, hopefully you understand, the provider for my family. I am the one to give sustenance to my children. I am responsible. Fathers, you are responsible for the provision of your family. Sustenance, but not just sustenance, but also teaching. And I won't beat a dead horse, belabor a point. Uh, when we were on the father-son camp out, we preached on this. And I, 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 let, let me uh, uh, develop the idea a little bit differently. Maybe something I should have said. But can I tell you that the first um, uh, um, institution ordained by God in Scripture is not the church. The church is not the first institu institution ordained by God. The first institution that's ordained by God is the marriage, is a family. Dad's our responsibility is to provide not just sustenance, but teaching for our children. Uh, we cannot, and, and I, 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 I uh, bear the responsibility to provide spiritual food to feed the flock of God from the, from the pulpit. But you cannot put it all on the pulpit to teach your children. Dads, you are responsible for the teaching of your children. You are responsible for teaching them this book. You're responsible for teaching them to walk in the ways of this word. You are responsible. Now, hopefully, uh, uh, as you come to Lafayette Bible Baptist Church, uh, there's a pastor and there's Sunday school teachers and, and a Christian school that will assist in that, but you are responsible for that. Uh, uh, dads, a father is the one that bears the, the burden of providing teaching for his family. I say, well, I'll, I'll give them what they need physically, but we're going to take them to church and let the pastor give them what they need spiritually. Uh, you will not raise children in the Lord. You might raise them in church, but you will not raise them in the Lord if you do that. They, uh, uh, you need to eat more than twice a week. Right? I mean, maybe some of you eat twice a week. Maybe you only eat on Sundays and Wednesdays. I won't have a raise of hands, but I would doubt that there's anyone that only eats on Sundays and Wednesdays. You need to eat more than twice a week, and spiritually speaking, you need to eat more than twice a week. Uh, parents, uh, dads especially, bear the responsibility. I, when we were at the father-son camp out, we talked about teaching formally and informally. And then uh, the, the next point, we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, that is something I, I, uh, I realize I'm, I might be beating a dead horse. The men that were there at father-son camp out uh, preached on specific things that we need to, to teach. But, but fathers, embrace, get a hold of, get that. You are responsible for teaching your children. Bear that, be the provider, be the, we're going to use the word again, provisionary, the one that gives the provision for teaching in your home. Even when we go to First, uh, we go to First Timothy, when it talks about the, the wives not speaking in church, we, uh, being, the father being the head of the home, it's not just the children, fathers, husbands. Now listen, this is not popular teaching in today's culture, but husbands, as the head of the home, you should be teaching your wives as well. Far too many Christian homes, the, the spiritual leader of the home is the mother, the wife. And I'm not saying that the wife is not as important. Oh, no, I'm not saying that. They're, they're equally important, but the roles are clearly defined in Scripture. And uh, husbands, dads, fathers need to be providers, not just in sustenance, 
but in teaching. And not just in teaching, but in example. Dads, be the example. Uh, again, we preached on this at the Father's Son Camp Out, and I don't want to uh, belabor this point, but uh, if we're providing teaching, then let's provide the example. Let's not be the, the hypocrites. Uh, a hypocrite, let's not just teach and say, hey, this is what you should do, and then go and do something else. Be the example. Um, men, dads, fathers, your young men should learn how to love a wife in the home. And then they should see how that is, uh, how it's done, because you've been the example to them. And we could go on and on and on, uh, teach them spiritual things, and then follow up and do those things. To be a, a church member, to be a, 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 a Christian, to be a godly Christian, uh, your children ought to see that, you ought to be that example. Can I say that Jesus provided for his mother? He was uh, providing, uh, though fathers provide sustenance, teaching, and example. He wasn't, uh, Jesus wasn't providing a, a teaching, an example. He was sustenance. But scripturally speaking, we understand that a, a, a father should provide teaching and an example. But Jesus was providing despite certain things. First of all, let me say this. He was, uh, he was providing despite gruesome difficulties. Now I want to think I want you to think about this. He's been beaten. He's been scourged. Uh, the, the Bible talks about the pain and the suffering that Jesus Christ went through that his visage was barely recognizable. Uh, literally his body falling apart. He's hoisted up, a, a nailed to a cross, and it hoisted up and dropped in the ground. And here he is on a cross in pain and misery. To say gruesome difficulties would really say it lightly. He's in a lot of pain. He's in a lot of challenges. And yet, during the pain, in the difficulties, in the, challenge, in the challenges, what is Jesus doing? He's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about the provision that must be given to his mother. Many of us would be thinking about ourselves. Many of us would think uh, on the cross, woe is me, I I'm thankful for the testimony of the, the family on Wednesday night. They weren't even here in church. In fact, a couple of our church uh, families were either late or didn't make it into the service because uh, there was a, an RV that, that uh, caught on fire on the side of the road on, on 64, on 40, over by the bridge. And how many saw that coming from St. Charles or from that area? A number of folks, nobody raised their hand. Okay, never, no one saw that. But I know that uh, um, there was a couple of families that, that mentioned they saw it. And there's a couple of our, fam our church family that had stopped and tried to help him. I was talking to Brother McCusker, and, and uh, it was an older uh, uh, gentleman and his wife, and they were Christian. They, they, were, they believed in the Lord, and uh, they had, uh, I think it was three of their grandkids with them that they were taking on vacation. They'd picked up from Kansas City. They were going to Florida. And Brother McCusker said, made the comment. He, they, he picked them up. They didn't have any vehicle. Their, their, everything they had in their, their RV caught on fire and was gone. Uh, they had a special needs granddaughter that had a chair there, uh, much like Sephora's, and, and it was burnt up and gone, and, and they had medicine that they needed for... And, and uh, Brother McCusker, uh, as a good Samaritan might do, I'm thankful for the, the, the godly people at Lafayette Bible Baptist Church. Brother McCusker, uh, got, they got him to a hotel, and Mrs. Martin had helped him get to a hotel, and Brother McCusker took the, the gentleman, took the dad over to Walmart uh, to get some things. And Brother McCusker said... They were just so, I think the word he used was chill. The Bible word would be peaceful. They, they said, we have our Bibles, and we can get whatever else we need. Their RV and all that they'd had in, in that was destroyed and gone. He said they weren't upset. And I remember Brother McCusker, this is his words, not mine. I don't know if he's listening on the parking lot. He said, I would have been, woe is me. I'm sure you can see Brother Tom, Brother Tom saying that, Brother Cusker saying that. I would have had an attitude, woe is me, but they were not. They were trusting in the Lord. Think about the song the ladies sung. Uh, uh, look, when we are trusting in the Lord, we can take our eyes off of ourselves and begin to look at others. Here's Jesus going through an absolutely painful, difficult time. 
How many times have you heard a father or a dad, a, a deadbeat, if you will, dad say, well, it's because of this excuse and because of this excuse and I can't provide because I've, uh, I've gone through this and I've had this challenge. What was Jesus' excuse on the cross? He could have had a number of excuses to say, well, I'm going to be gone, but in his, in his pain and in his agony and there in the last few moments of life, before new life, before resurrection, that, that what seemed to be life, he said, woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. He's providing even in difficult times. Dad, sometimes it becomes difficult. That does not negate the responsibility to be a provider. Say, well, I have health problems. Uh, we've had financial troubles. We have difficult things g come up. Uh, those, aren't, uh, those don't negate your responsibility to be a provider for your family. I remind you, 1 Timothy chapter 5, but if any provide not for his own, and especially, I'm sorry, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let me mention this. He provided not just despite gruesome difficulties, but d despite greater distractions. And that, again, is as uh, an understatement. Despite greater distractions. Now think about this. Was Jesus coming back in just a few days? Yeah. He was, he, did he really need to tell John that? Did he really need to say, did Jesus know? Jesus knew what was going, uh, what was going on. In fact, when he was 12, he was, uh, he, he was already about his father's business. And yet, despite that, despite all the, the greater implications that he's literally providing, not just for a mother, he's providing for the world. While he's providing for the entire world, providing salvation for the entire world, you'd think that might have his attention. You might, you might think, well, that's, that's a bigger deal than this right here. And yet, with all of that going on, with the greater implications going on, he's still providing for his mother. Men, guys, sometimes we get the attitude, well, there's something bigger going on. I got something more important at work. Now listen, Something going on at work doesn't even compare to what Jesus was doing for eternity. But sometimes we get the mentality of I've got something greater going on, something more important going on. I've got to do something else rather than providing for our family. Was there a bigger, a greater distraction for Jesus? Certainly. Was there a bigger deal going on? Absolutely. And yet, despite that, not negating his responsibility to provide for the world, he still provided for his mother. He was, I'm going to use the word again, a provisionary. He was a provider. He was providing, even though there would be something, a greater distraction. And let me say this, finally, I, I pointed out the beneficiary, <clears throat> excuse me, the beneficiary of his provision, the burden of his provision. And then uh, thirdly and finally, Excuse me, let me point out the balance of his provision. As Jesus provided for his family on earth, he obeyed the demands of his heavenly father and in doing so, provided for all the earth. Look over at Luke chapter 2. We won't take time to read all of it. But Luke chapter 2, we'll come back to John 19. Luke chapter 2. Verse number 40, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover when he was 12 years old. And when he was 12, excuse me, when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to be in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they had found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple. Now he's, presumably, he doesn't say this, but presumably he's been sitting in the temple for three days. Three days. Uh, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, 
Why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he came down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. That's an amazing statement to me that he increased. Jesus increased. Well, wait a minute. He's God. He's all that he needs to be. But Jesus in his humanity increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And I certainly am not gonna, uh, don't, would not say that he was sinning by being in the, the, uh, uh, the temple that day with the doctors. I'm not going to say that by any means. But the Bible says in his humanity that he increased in wisdom and in favor with God and man. So while he's in the temple, he says, hey, I'm supposed to be about my father's business. Don't you know that? Don't you know that I'm supposed to be about my father's business? And they said, no, they didn't get it. But from that point on, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Now, in his, in his deity, he didn't need to increase in anything. But in his humanity, he increased in wisdom and stature in favor with both God and man. By the end of his life, well, where he was going to be crucified, Jesus, there is no end of Jesus' life. But when he's going to be crucified, he's not walking away from his parents or not neglecting them. Again, I'm not saying that he was sinning in that. I think he was ambitious about his father's work, but somehow in his humanity, and you say, Pastor, can you explain that? I'm not sure I understand that. I just know that he increased. How did he increase? I don't know that I understand that completely. In his humanity, he increased in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. At his crucifixion, he says, I'm going to listen. As I'm providing, I'm going to provide. He's providing for the sins of the whole world on the cross. As he's doing that, he's providing for his mother. He's providing what he... What to, now, certainly he wasn't supposed to provide as a 12-year-old. I'm not implying that. But his, he's seeing what he must do completely. The whole picture... He's doing everything he needs to. Romans chapter 3, I mentioned verse 23, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be, God set, Jesus Christ set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. The rest of his provision was providing for you and me. While he's providing on the cross, while he's being the justifier, the, the justifier says he was just and he was the justifier. I don't know about you, but I need a justifier. I need someone to justify me. I can't come to God and say, hey, I'm perfect, but Jesus Christ can. And on the cross, he's being the justifier. He's being the propitiation for our sins. But while he's doing that, he provided. And my plea this morning is to fathers. Fathers, be the provider. Let's be like Jesus. He is our example and not just our Savior. In His deity, He is our Savior. But in His humanity, He is our standard. He is the provider. If you've not received His provision, His propitiation on the cross, then today I beg and plead, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you have, then not only is Jesus Christ your Savior, He is your standard. He is your example. Embrace. I realize I'm preaching to men and there's um, young men in the room. Again, I will say, a wise man storeth up knowledge. You say, well, I'm not a dad yet, but maybe one day you will be. And I realize I'm not preaching, to, uh, not just preaching to men, I'm preaching to ladies and young ladies as well. Uh, there are truths that we must embrace in every message. But I am addressing fathers mostly to this morning. Guys, fathers, 
embrace the, the responsibility of being a provider. Uh, provide uh, um, sustenance, provide teaching, provide an example. Follow the standard, follow the example of Jesus Christ and be a provider. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your love for us. God in heaven, we thank you for providing for us. You provided Jesus Christ who in turn provided for us. On the cross, he was the propitiation. He was the justifier, as the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, I think, verse 26 or 27. He was the justifier. Lord, we're thankful for giving us a justifier, for giving us a provision. I pray that, Lord, you'd help us to be the providers in our families that we need to be, uh, that we would provide uh, uh, not just sustenance, but teaching and an example. And, and then to others, Lord, to, to give the, the, uh, provide the gospel of Jesus Christ, to, to be preachers of the gospel to others. So we pray we ask in Jesus' name for his sake. We ask with heads bowed and eyes closed. How many would say, Pastor, I have a justifier. I've accepted Christ as my Savior, and I, I know it. I have no doubt about that. That's me. I'll slip my hand up. Pastor, I know I'm saved. Don't have any doubt about it. I, am a, I have a justifier. As it says, thank you. Put your hands down. Romans chapter 3. Would there be one or more pastor that says, that would say, Pastor, I know that Jesus provides salvation, but I've never accepted his gift on the cross. I've never received Jesus Christ. And I'd like to know more about that. Anyone like that this morning would say, that's me, Pastor. I'll raise my hand. I don't know Christ as my Savior. I've never received him. I don't know that I'm saved. Anyone like that at all? If you're saved and you know it, then we need to be obedient to him. And men especially, but the, any truth that, that, is, that we uh, can apply ourselves to, we need to follow. Are you providing? Men, are you providing? Say, I'm not a dad yet. Teenagers, young men, I'm not a dad yet. Determined to be, uh, follow the example of Jesus Christ and be a provider. Father in heaven, we ask you bless this invitation to your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, as the piano begins to play, Brother Schrock begins to sing, let's stand to our feet. The altar is available. You do business with the Lord as he leads. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid?